Thank you. It is always great for us to be back together with you all. You might remember that last year I told a story about my sons and a forge. Well, my wife is sitting right there to make sure that I am careful in the stories that I tell this year. But next to her is my son, so we will just have to see what happens. <laughs> he is holy. God is majestic, transcendent, pure, and perfect in his being. We measure all beings. We, we measure according to height and according to depth. We measure by length. We measure by time, but not God. God in His being is perfect, pure being, and beyond measure. My task this morning with you is to look at God's omniscience, that He is all-knowing, that His understanding is beyond measure. And to begin, we are going straight to the summit. We are going to Romans chapter 11 and Paul's doxological conclusion. Please turn with me to Romans chapter 11. We will begin at verse 33. And we will read through the end of the chapter, verse 36. Romans chapter 11, verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are His judgments and how inscrutable His ways! For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been His counselor? Or who has given a gift to Him that He might be repaid? For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be glory forever. Amen. Pray with me, please. Father God, we sense, even opaquely, we sense that here You have invited us in to see Your majesty, Your glory, Your holiness. Assist our finite minds as we ponder Your infinite wisdom and knowledge and understanding. Assist our feeble tongues so that we ascribe to You the glory due Your name. Assist us, we pray. Amen. Verse 33 identifies three things, riches, wisdom, and knowledge. This is the epistle to the Romans, written to them in the city of Rome. And the city of Rome at this moment in the first century thought it had a corner on the market on all three of these things. Riches, wealth, and, and money poured into the capital city of Rome. Gold and all that glitters and all the trappings of wealth were visibly and vividly on display in the city of Rome. Wisdom. These are the Romans at the end of five or six centuries of the philosophical quest. These are philosophers, the lovers of wisdom, Sophia. And here they are at the first century, having arrived at wisdom. And understanding and knowledge, this is the society of scientists and astronomers, and mathematicians, and geometers, and they had peeled back the heavens, and they had laid bare the universe, and they understood all things. These Romans who had amassed riches 
and wisdom and knowledge. And then Paul says, oh, the depths. How much more God possesses riches and wisdom and knowledge. And Paul, in these verses, as he brings this long theological discourse to a doxological conclusion, Paul cobbles together from the Psalms and from Isaiah and from Job to show the supremacy of God, the grandeur of God, the godness of God. And he starts with understanding. Paul says, how unsearchable His judgments, how inscrutable His ways. We scrutinize the ways of others, don't we? This is what teachers, or what students rather, do with their teachers. They scrutinize their teachers. What are they looking for on this exam? What does this teacher want me to know? And we, we study them. And we analyze them, and we scrutinize them, and we figure it out. This is what our kids do. They scrutinize us. Like some predatorial animal, they identify our weak spot. <laughs> this is what our pets do. We, we have a neighborhood dog, Charlie. I can tell you Charlie has scrutinized his master's ways. He knows how to break out of the house. And he has scrutinized the path to our house. And he comes down the sidewalk, and he doesn't even go to the driveway and up and around the sidewalk and to our front door. Oh, no, on the sidewalk, straight in our front door, makes a sharp right angle turn straight to our door, looks in the bottom pane of glass for our dog, Daisy. I'm a protective parent. I send Charlie on his way. Our dogs, our pets, they've figured us out. We scrutinize, don't we? We scrutinize our bosses figure out their judgments, scrutinize their ways. My boss is, is sitting right there. I never scrutinize him, of course. <laughs> but not God. But not God. And here's why. Verse 34. For who has known the mind of the Lord. Or who has been His counselor? This is a quote from Isaiah 40. Turn back with me to Isaiah chapter 40. It's at verse 13. And here we are, understanding beyond measure. Here we are talking about measuring things. Look at verse 12 of Isaiah chapter 40. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of His hand. The grandeur of God. Isaiah is setting us up for the grandeur of God. The seas that terrify us. God measures them in the hollow of His hand. And then verse 13, who has measured the Spirit of the Lord or what man shows him counsel? In the ancient Near Eastern world, the context in which this was given, the gods, the plurality of gods, the pantheon held councils. And each god had a particular area, and they would advise, and they would deliberate, much like a president would gather his cabinet to seek counsel from his advisors, not God not God. And so, what does Isaiah say at verse 18? To whom then will you liken God, or what likeness compare with Him? And again, at verse 25, still in Isaiah 40, to whom then will you compare me, that I should be like Him, says the Holy One? 
And at the end of verse 28, his understanding is unsearchable. We come back to Romans 11. We see why Paul pulls in this text from Isaiah chapter 40 to remind us of who God is. Theologians call this understanding of God omniscience, that God knows, science is the English word, scientia is the Latin knowledge, that God knows all. Augustine says God knows all things together at once. God knows all things together at once. Turretin, Calvin's few generations successor, theologian at Geneva, goes on to say that God is immutable in His being, in His essence. There is no shadow of turning with Him. God is immutable. And then He makes the connection, therefore His knowledge is immutable. This is what Turretin says, God is immutable, so He sees the various turns and changes of things by an immutable cognition. Now, before our heads explode this morning, let's say that again slowly and let's unpack it. God has knowledge of mutable creatures, mutating from an immutable cognition. This is not a supercomputer making split-second calculations. God's knowledge reflects God's being, and in God's being, He is perfect and eternal and immutable, and His knowledge is perfect and eternal and immutable. What does the writer of Hebrews say in 4.13? He talks about us as naked and exposed. We as human beings are an open book before God. In Psalm 147.4, we are told that God knows all the stars, and He has named them. And then God knows not only the hairs on our head, but He knows the ever-changing numbers of hairs on our head at once. Nothing surprises God. Nothing catches God off guard. Nothing is new information that God now has to process. When Turretin God says God sees through all of the turnings and variations of finite, mutable beings from an infinite, immutable cognition, he's telling us God is not in the process of becoming. He's not in the process of learning. He's not in the process of acquiring knowledge so that he can make a good judgment. God knows all things together at once. And that's why he's God. Now, we, we embrace this. This is, this is why we can trust in this God, because He knows all things. We embrace this, but through the centuries of church history, there have been those who have challenged this. In fact, in our own day, we saw it among self-professed evangelicals. This was the open theism movement. And open theism declared that God does know all things that He can know. And he doesn't know the future 
Because the future is yet to be determined. Because human agents are co-determining the future. And when we get there, God will know it. That, that is not a God we need. We don't need a God like us. We don't need a God who, who comes alongside of us on our journey to co-determine our future. We don't need a God who's even just better than us or more than us. We need a God whose understanding is beyond measure, who is robed in splendor and majesty and dwells in inapproachable light. The attributes of God must be understood in terms of the essence of God. And as God is perfect and immutable, so His knowledge is perfect and immutable. And do you know what that means? It means that you can trust Him with your very life. We wonder sometimes, does God understand? Does God know? Yes, He knows. He knows not only perfectly, but He knows within the context of His goodness. He understands our frailty and our feeble hearts and our fickle minds. And what does, what does David say at Psalm 139? Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. He, he, he puts the pen down or the whatever he had. It's too high. I cannot attain it. This God who's understanding. This is why Proverbs tells us, lean not on your own understanding. And think about this. Everyone we go to wisdom for, and we should, we're commanded to in Proverbs to seek wisdom. The pastoral epistles lay out for us a plan of the church where the older advises the younger, and the younger look to the older for their wisdom. We seek wisdom. Everyone we seek wisdom from got it, from somewhere else, outside of themselves. Everyone we seek counsel and advice from got counsel and advice. But there is one who has no counselor, has no advisor, has never been taught because He knows all things, and He invites us to trust in Him. This is why it is so important we pay attention to God's Word, because here He has revealed to us His will. It is so important not to doubt the sufficiency of God's Word, but to trust in it because behind it is the perfect, eternal, immutable understanding and knowledge and wisdom of our God. And this is why we pray. And what do we pray? We, we pray alongside Christ in the garden, not my will because my will is based on my finite understanding and my limited knowledge and my need to get wisdom. But not God. And we pray as Christ taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We don't know better than God, and we don't know better than God's Word, and we don't know better than God's will. I shudder when I think of this. The poet Jacques Prévert, French poet, 
Our Father, he says, who art in heaven, stay there. And we'll stay here on earth. Such blasphemy. But such lunacy. This is the pride of our age. This is the culture we find ourselves in. Such a shallow view of God. Leave us alone. We'll figure this out. Leave us alone. We don't need you anymore. We've got it covered. This is the dynamic of the 20th and now into the 21st century where we push God out to the margins and then all of a sudden we don't need Him. We tame Him and domesticate Him and then we dismiss Him because we're so proudful in our own understanding of things. It's a problem of our culture, isn't it? but it impacts us in the church. And the diminished view of God leads to a diminished life. We think by freeing ourselves from God, we can now soar into the stratosphere, free to ascend to the heights. It's the opposite. By pretending to sever ourselves from God, we plunge ourselves into the abyss and the depth. Henry Acton was a whaling ship captain, as was his father before him and his father before him. And in 1838, he wrote what was hailed as a true and exciting account of a whaling ship's captain. He wrote it for his son, William, and he begins by conveying to his son William how impressive the whale is. And he's amazed at the strength of the whale. One flip of the whale's tail, and the great ship is capsized. And then Henry Acton, from his decades of, of hunting whales in the seas, has come to the conclusion that whales are extremely intelligent creatures. And he is humbled by their strength and by their intelligence. And then Henry Acton takes a step back and he says, what does this say about the Creator who created this creature? And he goes right to Romans 11, and then he says this, how must our pride be lowered? That is how we should engage the world. Not, not inflating our pride, but the opposite. And the more we discover and the more we learn, the more we see the majesty of God. And if we all sit along with Henry Acton on page 12, how must our pride be lowered? Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been His counselor? In verse 35, Paul quotes from Job, or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? It's from Job 41. Turn back with me. It's a speech. It's a long speech. It's, it's the definitive speech. It begins in chapter 40. Chapter 40, verse 6, Job's friends have had their speeches. Job has had his speech. I don't know what Job's friends rolled up in when they came to Job, but here's how God came onto the scene. He came in a whirlwind. It was out of the whirlwind. And the speech runs from chapter 40, verse 6, all the way to the end of chapter 41. And in the speech, there's behemoth 
and Leviathan and these great creatures that strike awe and terror. But he's the creator behind the creatures. And then we come to it, don't we, at verse 11. Who has first given me that I should repay him? Whatever, un, whatever is under the whole heaven, it's mine. It's mine. This is the depth of the riches of God. This was behind R.C.'s pursuit of the holiness of God. This quest to free ourselves from that casual, far too, all too casual view of God that dominates the culture and sadly dominates the church. It is this view of God that we desperately need. It is a God whose understanding is beyond measure. That is a God that demands, that demands our worship. That is a God that demands our adoration. That is a God that demands our service. A God whose understanding is beyond measure, demands and deserves our trust, our submissive obedience, our loving adoration, and our worship. As the R.C. taught us so well, theology leads to doxology. Theology leads to praise and worship. And so we have verse 36. All things, all things, for from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. Isn't it amazing that this God beyond measure is interested in what comes from us back to Him? Is not this a sign of God's graciousness that He wants our humble acts of sacrifice back? Is not this a great and glorious God that wants what we do with our lives to come back to Him? The application of this text, the application of this idea that God's understanding beyond measure is very simply this. We praise Him with all of our being, with all of our lives, with, with every moment of our time. But there are two particular applications that I'd like to pull out of this text. One, we need to stretch back eight verses, back to verse 25. Lest you be wise in your own sight. There's nothing wrong with wisdom. We're commanded to be wise and get wisdom. The problem here is the standard and the evaluation. Uh, Self-awareness is a great thing. Self-evaluation is a great thing. But we are not the standard for what is wise. And look at what the context is. You know the context of Romans 9 and 10 and 11. We are in the tall grass of the doctrine of election. Oh, there's no controversy there. (laughs) For centuries, we have wanted to help out God with a better doctrine of election. Millennia. For millennia, we have thought that we know better than God when it comes to His plan of salvation. And so, we are very wise 
in our own eyes. The application is to submit. Is not this Job's response? I have put my hand over my mouth and I am silent. Oh, this, this isn't fair, God. This strikes me as unjust. I don't know how this relates to your love and kindness and mercy, so let's tweak it a little bit. First application is stop fooling ourselves. Stop thinking we are wise in our own eyes and we know better than God when it comes to His Word and when it comes to His will and when it comes to His work. It's a call to humility is what it is. We are to be humbled by God's omniscience that He has understanding beyond measure, that keeps us in check. That keeps us in check. We have a second practical application, and this time we'll push forward. We'll go forward two verses. There's a verse in chapter 12, verse 2, perhaps you've heard of it. It's a phrase in there you might have heard before around these conferences. Have you noticed what's going on in verse 2? It's all intellectual. It's the renewal of our mind, and the action is discernment, and the result is the good, which has to be known, that which is well-pleasing, which has to be known, and then how about this? and the perfect. Uh, Why do we need to transform our minds? Why do we need this renewal of our thinking? Because when left to our own, our minds pursue the immoral, and our senses gravitate towards the aroma, the stench of death. And if it was left up to us, we'd always settle for the lesser, and the perfect would go right on by. Theologians call the omniscience of God a communicable attribute. You know what communicable means. You can get it. There's 5,000 people here. Wash your hands. That's all I'm going to say. We do not have equal knowledge to God. We do not have equal strength to God. But we have an analogous knowledge and strength to God. As God knows perfectly as the Creator, so we can pursue knowledge as the created. And with a renewed mind, we can begin to align our sinful intellect to the mind of God. As we immerse ourselves in God's Word and we understand His ways, and we submit our understanding to His understanding, a transformation takes place. And all of a sudden, the immoral is seen for all of its unworthiness. And we want the good. And all of a sudden, our senses are keen to the stench of death. And we only want that which is well-pleasing. And we stop playing around with the lesser. We stop being satisfied 
with the lesser things and with full throttled pursuit we go after the sacred. Because God's knowledge is beyond measure, we are to spend a Christian lifetime pursuing knowing Him. And knowing Him in His transcendence. And knowing Him in His majesty, robed in splendor. Not, not knowing Him as we have hemmed Him in to make Him palatable to modernist or postmodernist taste. But to know Him who from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. As our minds are transformed, we come up from the depths, don't we? And we pursue the holy. We're like Moses's coming down off the mountain with a glow. We're nuclear. We radiate. And we pursue the holy. Oh, the depths of this God who knows us and loves us. May we know Him. May we know Him. He who is holy. Let's pray. Father God, perfect and pure being, majestic in beauty and glory and holiness, You are most wise. You know all things perfectly, and You are good. May we not be wise in our own eyes but may we in humble submission trust You in all things. For You are working all things according to Your good and wise and perfect will, and it's all for Your glory. And may we trust and may we rest in You. In the name of Your Son, amen.